Revelation chapter 3. Title this message, An Audience of One. An Audience of One. We are looking today at Laodicea. At least as late as J. Vernon McGee's lifetime, Laodicea was the least excavated of any of these seven cities. The only remains that could be seen during J. Vernon McGee's lifetime were those that were protruding, protruding through the thicket, protruding through the growth. What we do know about Laodicea is they were wealthy. They were a wealthy city and very self-sufficient. In fact, the great earthquake that destroyed a number of the other cities that we've talked about, when the emperor offered monies to help rebuild, Laodicea turned down that money and chose rather to rebuild themselves. It would be the equivalent today of someplace down in Florida or Louisiana or someplace that's prone to hurricanes turning down federal disaster relief funds and instead choosing to rebuild themselves. I heard a story some years ago about a great pianist. This great pianist would often play concerts. And at one particular concert, concert's over, the audience is giving him a standing ovation, applauding him for his great skill at the piano. But backstage, he can be heard by those who are assisting him, crying out, I'm a failure, I'm a failure. And the folks around him are like, what do you mean you're a failure? Look out there. Everyone's applauding you. Those applause are for you. Look, everyone is giving you a standing ovation. They're asking for an encore. He said, yeah, but look at that, that man down on the front row. He's not standing. He's not applauding. They looked out. Just a little elderly Elderly man, not well-dressed, kind of scraggly looking. One of the folks assisting him says, Oh, that old codger, what's he know? Deanna says, You don't get it. That man's my teacher. If the whole world applauds you, if the whole world gives you a standing ovation and Jesus does not applaud you, you are a failure. The church at Laodicea was just that. Their culture, their city, the wor their world applauded them, but Jesus does not applaud them. In fact, if You'll recall these last six weeks, every church receives a commendation. The Lord Jesus praising each of those churches for what they did right. But today, Laodicea gets no praise. Jesus finds nothing praiseworthy in this Laodicean church. How many churches here in Ripley County and across the United States get no praise from the Lord Jesus? How many churches across these United States get the applause of men but no praise from the Lord Jesus? Revelation chapter 3 beginning in the 11th verse. Anna. Okay. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in the 11th verse. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, 
and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I, sp I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes sad, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my, my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. As we go to the Lord in prayer, think about those promises. About your new name and sitting with the Lord Jesus in his throne. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, you are the only audience that we need. We serve you alone. We give glory to you alone. We worship you alone. Lord, we pray that you would call us to examine ourselves. That we would correct where we compromise, that we would correct where we are complacent. That we will serve you well. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. We will come back to verses 11 and 12. Beginning with verse 14, we see this, that the outline is the same. The speaker's identification, the speaker's knowledge, the speaker's commands, promise, and exhortation. The speaker's identification, as is John's custom with each of these seven churches. He pulls something from what he said in chapter 1 and employs it in his address to Laodicea. Here at Laodicea, the speaker identifies himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. J. Vernon McGee rightly points out that this is the only place in Scripture where Amen is a proper name, and it is the name of Christ. I guarantee you that everyone in this room knows at least one Greek word. Amen. Amen. Simply means truly, verily, verily. So let it be. J. Vernon McGee points to Isaiah 65, verse 16. It says, The God of truth, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9, if ye will not believe. And he says, and he points out that you could easily 
replace the God of truth with the God of amen. Or if you will not believe, if you will not amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, For all the promises of God in Him are yea, and in Him amen. So let it be. Jesus is true. Jesus is verily. Jesus is period. Jesus is the amen, the last word. He will fulfill the promises of God. Indeed, He did, and He will fulfill the promises of God. Everything that we see in the Old Testament pointing to the first incarnation, to the first advent, which we see in the incarnation, points to Jesus. And when Jesus came and was laid in that feeding trough and lived for 30 some years, ministered for approximately three years, went to the cross and died, Jesus, every step of the way, fulfilled the promises of God. And when Jesus comes again, He will fulfill the remaining promises. When you and me see Him as He is. He identifies Himself to the Laodiceans this way because they rejected His deity. There are churches all across this land, and even here in Ripley County, that reject the deity of Christ. Oh, they may give lip service that Jesus is Lord and God, but they do not live in such a way that their profession matches their life. Laodicea rejected the Lord's deity. They were more dependent on what they could do and more dependent on their own resources than they were on the creator of the universe. The word amen points, as J. Vernon McGee points out, the word amen is the only thing that he draws out of the vision of himself that we had in the first chapter. He is faithful and true even in the days of apostasy. The days of apostasy right there in the late 60s in Laodicea. The days of apostasy right there in Asia Minor. Because each of these churches, with the exception of Philadelphia, had something that Jesus condemned. So there was apostasy taking place. Those listening to the doctrines of Balaam, those listening to the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, those leaving their first love. But Jesus is faithful and true even in the midst of apostasy. Do we not see apostasy around us today? Do we not see churches today lowering the standard, lowering the standard, lowering the standard, all in the name of getting more people in? But isn't it interesting that every time you lower the standard, fewer people darken the doors? Why is that? Because when we make the church look more like the world, the world says, why do I need it? They don't offer anything different than that which I already have. He is the creator. If you reject Genesis, you by default reject Revelation. Because right here in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus identifies himself as the beginning of the creation of God. You will either live by speculation or you will live by revelation, but you cannot live by both. Re speculation 
is evolution. Speculation is saying this, this, and this happened. We have no witnesses who were there. We can only speculate that it happened this way. Revelation says the Lord God declared this is what happened, and we have it written in His Word. And we trust His Word. So will you live by speculation, or will you live by revelation? Verses 15 through 17, we see the speaker's knowledge. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Now, how many of you have heard preachers in the past interpret this, that Jesus would rather you be either spiritually hot or spiritually cold? How many of you have heard preachers in the past interpret this, that Jesus either wants you to be on fire for him or cold and distant from him? Have you ever heard that? I've heard it. There's a problem with that. The application of hot and cold to spiritual temperature would have been foreign to these first century Christians. They would not have understood hot as being fervent for the Lord and cold as being distant from the Lord. And in fact... It's contrary to what Jesus wants. Can you fathom Jesus ever preferring you to be distant from Him? From, can you fathom Jesus preferring you to be unsaved, unregenerate? No. Both hot and cold are positives. The Lord Jesus says, I would that thou wert cold or hot, but you are lukewarm. Lukewarmness is useless to Christ. As we study Scripture, as we rightly divide the word of truth, as we apply sound hermeneutics, we have to know a little bit about a lot of subjects. And with regard to this passage, Jesus calling us to either be hot or cold, you know what subject is helpful? Geography. Geography matters here. Seven miles north of Laodicea was the city of Hierapolis, which was famous for hot springs. Now, if you're a student of history, there was a very good... There's not a whole lot on the History Channel that, that is good, but there was a good documentary couple months back on FDR. If you know anything about history, you know that FDR had been stricken in his younger years with polio. And he, he was paralyzed. During his pre presidency, they worked to present an image of strength. But he was not able to walk on his own. He was not able to walk without big, bulky braces on his legs to hold him up. FDR would often go to hot springs down in Georgia, I believe, that would provide therapy for him. That's what hot springs do. Hot waters are therapeutic. Hot waters are good. We even heat up hot water and flavor it for coffee, or in Charlotte's case, tea. Hot waters are good. Less than 10 miles away was the city of Colossae, which was known for cool waters. Cool water is good. You're out on a hot day, cutting the grass, doing some type of work outside. You come inside, and you want a nice, cold glass of water. 
If somebody gives you a lukewarm glass of water, you're going to do just what Jesus says. You're going to spew it out. Lukewarm water is useless and disgusting. Laodicea did not have their own water source. They had to have aqueducts. And so if, if, if they were piping water from Colossae that was known for cool water, by the time it got to Laodicea, the temperature had warmed up. Even though, even though much of the aqueducts would have been buried well, well below ground, when you get closer to the city of Laodicea, the pipes are exposed and the temperature rises, making it lukewarm. If you try to pipe it from Hierapolis, yeah, it's going to cool down, but it's not going to cool down to the temperature of Colossae. Either way, you're going to have lukewarm waters that are neither therapeutic nor refreshing. And the Lord Jesus says, I would rather you either be therapeutic or that you be refreshing, but instead you're lukewarm and you're useless and disgusting and I will vomit you out of my mouth. Christ detests the compromising, complacent, self-satisfied, and indifferent attitude of the Laodiceans. Do we not see that in denominations and churches to this day? Do we not see complacency and self-satisfaction? Folks building churches to suit themselves. Folks indifferent to the lost around them. Folks compromising the Lord's standards. This church was ignorant of their real condition. And in fact, they were wretched. Turn with me to Psalm 137. Psalm 137, verses 8 and 9. Psalm 137, verses 8 and 9. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth the little ones against the stones. Babylon, who took Israel, specifically Judah, captive, would be destroyed and judged themselves. Just as Judah was wretched and went into captivity to Babylon, so Babylon was wretched and would be taken over by another kingdom. Then we see the, king, the speaker's commands. Verses 18 through 20. I counsel thee to buy me gold trodden afar, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes sad, that thou mayest see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Christ's commands correspond to the Laodiceans' self-deception. Laodiceans were a financial center. They had the finances, they had the commerce, and they had the medicine. They were known for being a, fi a financial city. Think about New York City in 2001. Two towers, 110 stories each. The World Trade Center. And two planes took down the financial capital of this country. Gold 
must be brought from Christ if it's going to be true wealth. Will, will you and me de depend on the gold of this world or will we depend on the gold which the Lord Jesus supplies? His gold doth not rust. His gold doth not corrupt. White raiment. This was a center of commerce and particularly textiles. They dealt specifically in black wool. So you can imagine the contrast. Jesus promises white raiment to a church in a city that was known for producing textiles of black wool. And shows that only Christ can cover their nakedness. You and me are exposed by our sin. You and me live in shame by our sin. But Jesus promises white raiment. He alone can clothe. Just as Adam and Eve sought to cover themselves with fig leaves, the Laodiceans depended on their black wool. And the Lord Jesus says, that won't do. In the garden, God killed an animal, making the first sacrifice, covering Adam with the skin of the animal. In Laodicea, he replaces the black wool with white raiment, removing the stain of their sin and making them pure and holy in his sight. Turn over with me to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16, verse 15. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Their textiles in which they trusted, were their shame. But the Lord Jesus promises covering. I salve. The Laodiceans had their own school of medicine, and particularly a salve that would that would uh, that promised to, to cure eye and ear ailments. And as as I was reading, there was there was a, a, a clay that was found in the mountains near Laodicea, that they would mix with something, and they would use it as an eye sap. And this Fergian powder offered many promises. Many promises, by the way, that were unfulfilled. Think about modern medicine. We see a lot of commercials today. This promising this, this promising this. But whose promises are being kept? The promises of those drawing the prophets. The proof is in the pudding, is what they say. The Laodiceans had this Fergian powder, eye salve, that promised healing, but Jesus promises an eye salve that's not... black medicine, but is true medicine from the great physician. The, the Laodiceans needed authentic salvation through Christ. Think, think about what he says here. Going back up to verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold nor or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Then you come down to verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. 
Now, I've heard preachers, my, my former pastor being one of them, that saw in verse 20 hope. Because you may have all seen the artistic rendition of, of Jesus standing at this door and there's, there's not a handle on the outside because the handle's on the inside and you have to open the door to your heart. You may have always have often heard Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 being used evangelistically, but I've also heard pastors like my former pastor who said it wasn't an evangelistic verse because Jesus is standing outside the door of the church and the church is already saved. But if you look at the context of Revelation 3, 14 through 22, it's clear that this is not a regenerate church. This is an assembly, but it's not a called out assembly. They, they are a church, but they are not a true church. For Jesus to say, you're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm, and because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of your mouth, out of my mouth. We believe in the perseverance of the saints. The Lord Jesus will not spew out His true servants. He will not spew out those who are genuinely called by His name. Those who genuinely have come to Him in confession and repentance. These are folks who have a form of godliness, as Paul said in Romans, but they deny the power thereof. They may have all the outward appearance, but they're just like the Pharisees who clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of cursing and bitterness. They need authentic salvation. And there are folks who call themselves Christians all across this land who need authentic salvation. Indeed, I would venture to say and I will go on record as saying that the biggest mission field, the biggest mission field we have in the United States is not on Skid Row, but it's in sanctuaries every Sunday morning. Because folks are coming not to give glory and honor to the King of Kings, but they're coming to give glory and honor for their own traditions. The result of repentance is loyalty to Christ. And when you're lukewarm like the Laodiceans were, there is no loyalty to Christ. If you're loyal to Christ, Christ is not going to spew you out of His mouth. But if you're disloyal to Him, He will spew you out because you're lukewarm. You are useless and disgusting and sickening. But even still, to this unregenerate, false church, Jesus gives the promise that He will fellowship with those who hear His voice of rebuke and respond with zeal and repentance. Even to this, this unregenerate group who have a form of godliness but deny His power. Who have a form of godliness but deny that He is God. Denying His deity. He gives the promise that He will come in and fellowship with those who heed His warning. Who take His rebuke and respond with zeal and repentance. Turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verses 32 through 35. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus promises that his words will not pass away. Do you receive his rebuke? Do you receive his rebuke and respond with repentance and confession and zeal? James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. And lastly, turn with, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. Jesus promises something to those who will respond with zeal and repentance. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all the partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So those in Laodicea that don't heed his words that don't heed the warning that he gives of spewing them out are bastards. But those who heed the warning, who respond in, with zeal and repentance are sons. Chapter 3 verse 20 is every bit evangelistic. You and me are called by Christ to be his hands and feet in this generation. You and me are called by Christ to be his mouthpiece in this culture and in this county. You and me are called by Christ to knock on that door in Christ's stead, waiting for those on the other side to open their ears and their hearts the message of the gospel that we have to share. Then the promise. And as I promised, we'll go back to chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? He shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven, and my God. And I will write on him my new name. You know, it's interesting. Philadelphia and Laodicea being the last two churches that John addresses could not be, have been a more stark contrast. You have, a you have the church of Philadelphia, of which Jesus has nothing to condemn. And you have the church at Laodicea, of which Jesus has nothing to commend. Philadelphia was promised, I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. And I will write upon him, my new name. What's interesting about that is after the devastating earthquake in A.D. 17, Tiberius rebuilt the city and the people showed their gratitude by renaming it Neo Caesarea or New Caesar. Later in A.D. 70 to 79, the name was changed to Flavia, which alongside the original Philadelphia continued to be the name through the second and third centuries. So prior to the writing of this book, there was an attempt to change the name of the city of Philadelphia. After the writing of this book, going into the 2nd and 3rd century, there was a, an attempt to change the name of this city. And Jesus says to folks who were accustomed to new names, I will write upon him my new name. I, 
Jesus says to you and me, I will write upon you my new name. Alan F. Johnson, as we move into the promise to Laodicea, Alan F. Johnson says, As Christ overcame, so believers who suffer with Christ, even to the point of death, will share the honor of Christ's exalted position. So between the promises to Philadelphia and Laodicea, you have the promise of a new name, and you have the promise of overcoming. Philadelphians knew what it was to have a name change. And the Laodiceans who heeded the message of Christ knew the need to overcome. They needed to overcome their self-sufficiency in their gold and in their textiles and in their false medicines. They needed to overcome their complacency in their lives being represented by their own water supply. Their water supply was lukewarm and their lives were lukewarm. Their water supply was disgusting and sickening to them and their lives were sickening and disgusting to their Savior. And as Jesus closes each of his letters, verse 13 and verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do you hear Jesus' words? Do you hear his commendations of you? Do you hear his condemnations of you? Do you hear his promises? And do you look forward to receiving those promises in glory? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 through 28. Then cometh the end, when he shall be delivered up, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Is God your all in all today? Are you trusting in the new name that he gave you? You know, the Christians, the, the folks at Antioch were the first ones to be called Christians. Prior to that, believers were called the people of the way because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Has God, through the Lord Jesus, put death, your death, under his feet? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for calling us from darkness and the light. Lord, use this message to penetrate our hearts. And Lord, if there be one who's never trusted you, who's never come to you in repentance and confession, may this be the day of his salvation. In your name we pray. Amen.